Welcome to the Living Word, the teaching ministry of Pastor Fisayo Adeniyi, lead pastor of the Ransomed House Lagos. Get ready for enlightenment, encounter, and impartations by the Word. Be blessed as you listen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Look at your neighbor eyeball to eyeball and, I, and say to them, Welcome to church. If they are not replying, tell them that. If they are not replying, tell them that Nigeria is not that bad. I know that you will win over scarcity. I want you to declare I'm rich. I am blessed. I am conquered. Let me do what I know how to do. Stand up on your feet. Let's just go to the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, First John chapter 4, and then we read verses 7 to 11. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God you came to church. God has a word for you. It will bless you. It will transform you. I want you to relax. Be a doer of God's word. Because God's word has the ability to transform your life. Raise your right hand up to God and say, I receive God's word today and my life is transformed. I live by the power of the word of God. I live by the word. I receive the word with meekness, with quietness. And I know that the word do be good, does me good. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right, very quickly, First John chapter 4. Are you there? And then we read verses 7 to 11. First John 4, 7 to 11. When was the last time you read the book of First John? This morning, praise God. Before this morning, when was the last time you read the book of John, First John? I've not read anything that does not work. First John 4, 7 to 11, and the Bible says, uh, Beloved, you know, I'm saying this because you have never had love eat you the way it will eat you today. Right? Love does you mushy mushy, but this one will not do you mushy mushy. After today's service, some of you will have to call your parents, have to call your dad, and you have to apologize, and you have to say you are sorry. Some of you are very, very angry, not only with God, but you are angry with yourself. Some of you came here with your, yeah, some of you are even angry right now with me or with your spouse. It doesn't matter what you think, but receive God's word today and God's word will do you good. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let me read. Beloved. I love John. He said, Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We also ought to love one another. Today, for a few minutes, I'm speaking to you on dominated by love. Dominated by love. Um, if you play the, if you ever watch the game of football, uh, eventually when you are done with this, when, when you are eight, you will know everything about football because I passed on you. Amen. Uh, you will see that there will be matches they will say uh, Manchester City dominated them, which means that they had all the possession, they had all the match, they, they, they had all the balls, they had all the free kicks, and the other guys were just defending and running around. Why? Because they were dominated. Dominated. Listen, God's idea for our life is that love will possess you. So today I'm speaking to you on dominated by love. Can we pray? Father, thank you. Because the entrance of the word gives light, gives understanding unto the simple. As simple folks, we've come today to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. 
and I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I prayed. Amen. You can have your seats in God's presence. Some people even follow me as I need the prayers. Amen. I um, mean, you know what he's going to say next. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh -huh. Glory to Jesus. So I'm speaking to you on dominated by love. Let me start by saying that there are many things. Let me start by saying that there, there are many things that will not work in your life except you walk in love. Can I say it to you again? Many things will not work in your life except you walk in love. Now, that shocks many people and that's probably shocking you right now. The reason many people are stagnant is not because they are not praying. The reason many people are stagnant is because they are not walking in love. If we will walk in love, we would have many things. We will attain into the fullness even of God's blessing concerning our life. Second Peter chapter 1 and then verse 4. The Bible says, uh, He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Therefore, God has given you. It's not that God is planning to give you. It's that God has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And that involves and includes all the blessings of God. So if you are not walking in those blessings of God, it therefore means that something is amiss in your life. Allow me to say to you that God, you are not walking in the blessings of God because of the devil. Right? That's what you say. But listen to this. It is not the devil. It is your lack of a walk, even a walk in love. Now, I want to quickly start because I want to really get into certain stuff. So, the introduction is not going to be very major today. So, I want to ask, I want to say to you, reasons you should walk in love. Why is he always preaching about love? Why does he want to preach to us about love? Why is love important? Uh, reasons you should walk in love. Number one, love grants access to God's blessing. Uh, walking in love will grant you access to the blessings of God. I, is somebody getting what I'm saying? Huh? Walking in love will grant you what? Access even to God's blessings. That means that God has blessed you. That means that God has increased you. But you will not be able to access the blessings of God except you walk in love. Except you walk in love. Now listen to this. I, I want to share with you the reason many believers are living lesser than God's idea for their life. Why are you not walking in all that God asks for you? It's not the devil. It is something I call the Balaam strategy. And let me explain what is the Balaam strategy. Let me explain it to you. Listen to this. The Balaam was a hood prophet who had gone crazy or who was about to go crazy. So Balak had actually contracted him to go and curse his people, to curse Israel. And Israel could not be cursed. So after he had tried three times to curse Israel and he couldn't curse Israel, you know what he did? He advised the Amalekites. He advised uh, these people and said, and looked at um, and looked at Balak and said, listen, these guys cannot be caused, but this is what you can do. You can make them walk contrary to the blessings of God. You can make them walk contrary to the plan and the will of God for their life. So you have what they call the, uh, uh, them worshipping gods. Uh, and then they started sleeping around. By so doing, by so doing, they introduced into their life the cause without anybody causing them. Can I say that to you again? Uh, because he knew that they couldn't be cursed. So you know what he did to them? He advised them to let them go contrary to the commandments and the will of God. Because he knew that by going contrary to the commandment and the will of God, they would intentionally, like that, automatically release the curse upon their life. So the devil understands even today that he is not able to tame any believer. So what he can do is to introduce that same strategy. Meaning that if I can't curse you, if I can't make you to not walk in the blessings of God, I can introduce something into your life. If I can introduce offense, if I can introduce hate, if I can introduce bitterness into your life, then I can stop the blessings from coming to you. And that's what the devil does. The devil understands that he is not so big to be able to curse you. The devil understands that he is not so big to be able to win over you. But what he can do is to introduce the Balaam strategy. So that Israel went and was sleeping with ladies that God told them not to. By so doing, the curse came automatically into their life. Listen, the old serpent is still here. Walking in love will ensure that you walk in the blessings of God. That's number one. Why do you need to walk in love? Why is it important? Because faith walks by love. Faith walks by love. Listen, even faith, you know, uh, January we preach about faith. 
And as powerful as the force of faith is, even faith will not work. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says by faith, the elders obtain a good report. So it, it tells you, scripture says that, that now faith is the substance of things. So for the evidence of things not saying that. The uh, Bible again told us that the word was framed by the words of God. So it took faith to frame even God's word. So faith is important. Faith is key. But even faith will not work except by law. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. The Bible says now circumcision or not circumcision is nothing. It says, but faith that works by love. So that without love, your faith will not work. So that you see many believers say, you know, I've been confessing for a long time. I confess, I've confessed scriptures. I am married. I've confessed things that I have children. I've confessed. Listen, your confession will not work except you walk in love. This is the reason many of us are not walking in the blessings of God. Because that, that's why many people's faith have failed. Not because they have not honored the principles of faith, but because without love, faith will not work. Can you see how important love is? Number three. Why is love important? Because agape, love, is the greatest. I shared on that in the midweek service. And one of the scribes came to Jesus and asked Jesus, Mark 12, 28 to 31, which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus looked at him and said to love the Lord your God. He said, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. He said, that's the greatest commandment. And then he said, the second which is like it is to love your neighbor like yourself. So you can see that except you walk in love, there is nothing that prospers in our life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 and then verse 13, Paul was writing to the Christians at Corinth. He said to them very simply and very plainly, he said, now abide faith, oh, love. But the greatest of this is what? Love. Love. Number four, love is the proof of discipleship. And that's what you read when you were praying this morning. Love is the proof of discipleship. So that discipleship is not because you pray. I'm the disciple of Christ. In fact, when you hear the guy in his house, his tongues are ringing, the whole estate is waking up. That is not a proof of discipleship according to scriptures. Reading the Bible as much as I say that is important is not a proof of discipleship. The proof of discipleship, you know what the proof of discipleship is? It's to walk in love. That is the proof of discipleship. To walk in love. If you cannot, if you can't see the evidence of love in your life, then you are not a follower of Jesus. I'm not saying that. Scripture said that. John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give unto you. Bible says that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Can you see that? What Jesus said. He said by this, by love shall all men know that you are my disciples. When you love even one another. When you love one to another. Love is the proof. Bible says we know we are passed from death into life. Because we love the brethren. This is the proof that we are now transformed. This is the proof uh, that we are no longer in death. This is the proof that we are new creatures. Uh, He said we are passed from death to life. Because we love one another. Can you see that? that, that's, that's, That's the proof here. The proof is love. If a man say I love God and it is brother. God that he has not seen. How can he and then he hates his brother whom he has seen? First John chapter 4, verse 20. Scripture says he's a liar. You know, people say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And the emotion is amongst us. They start crying. I love you, Lord. And the tears start rolling. In fact, cameramen are looking for that kind of moment. Those are moments they freeze. I love you, Lord. And then the worshiper, the, the, the worship leader says he's anointed. Why? Because the, girl is, the lady is crying or the guy is crying. The guy is really crying. There are some that cry. I understand that. And they say, I love you, Lord. Well, I love you, Lord. And sometimes they cannot even stand. They are on their feet. They are rolling. And immediately after that time, they get out and they see somebody and the joy has ended. Why? Because they hate that guy with the passion. They don't want to see his face. And they have reasons for hating him. And the reasons are valid. Very valid. He broke their heart. He is not a nice guy. He spoke bad about her. He has told everybody in the community, lies about you. So you have every right. In fact, some prophet told you that he killed your father. <laughs> so you have got valid reason to hate them. The scripture says, this is how we know we have moved from death to life. By loving one another. Number five. Why is love important? Because love is the core of God. The central part of God is is love. 
God's love emanates from the human spirit. It is the object of the recreated human spirit. Listen to this. When I'm speaking about this kind of love, uh, it's, it's not, it's not emotional love. This is about love that is not about natural. It's not about feelings. It's not about what you think is the love of God. It's the love of God. It's not from your soul. It's not from your head. Have you ever been asked out by a guy? And then when you are with the person, you're feeling, oh my God, oh my word. You just with, in fact, the moment he says he's coming, the old time seems to freeze because he's coming. Hallelujah. What a beautiful time to love. Valentine is coming. Hallelujah. So it's a beautiful time to love. But this kind of love is not from emotion. It's from the spirit. God's kind of love is from your spirit. It is what is called the fruit of the recreated human spirit. It is not about feeling. It's not about reasoning. It's not about thought. God's kind of love has nothing to do with feeling. Your thought or your mind, it's completely about the Holy Spirit. God's kind of love is completely, tell your neighbor, God's kind of love is about the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit. Have you read Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23? Do you know what it says? The Bible speaks about what? Talk to me. If you don't know it, raise your hand. It's okay. That's why you came to church. The fruit of the Spirit. Which is the first fruit of the Spirit? The first. Love. Let me have that. Now, listen to this. People make a mistake when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. People think we are talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Do you read your Bible like that? Do you think the Bible says the fruits of the Spirit? Eh? You, it's, it's there so they can. I was going to say if you, if it is fruits, raise your hand. If it is fruits, raise your hand. But these slight guys, they, they have gone ahead of me. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, so the Bible speak about what the fruit of the spirit, and um, don't worry. But the fruit of the spirit is what? What's number one? Love. Number two. Joy. Number three. Number four. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self control. Against such there is no law. So, hallelujah. All right, so what is this? No, no, no. What is this? What is this in the natural? I'm not, I'm asking you, I'm asking you logical question. I'm not trying to give you trick. What is this? That's the problem with Nigeria. We, we find it difficult to even find the name for it. It's avocado. It's avocado. Who says it's pear? Sorry, let, let me continue. What is this? Do we agree this is apple? At least we agree that this is not apple and orange. This is apple, right? And what is this? This is watermelon, right? And this is banana. Now, if you plant, now follow me very closely. If I plant the seed, this seed, which is the seed of a watermelon. If I plant this seed, what will I get? Do we agree that's what I'm going to get? If I plant this, I'm going to get watermelon. Because upon the tree, and the fruit you are supposed to see, is supposed to only be watermelon. Is that not so? So that when we talk about the fruit of a tree, we are talking about what is planted to give you the fruit. Do we understand that? The seed that is planted to give you a fruit. Alright? So, that it does not therefore make sense for scriptures to begin to say that there is a fruit of the spirit and then there are a different kind of manifestation of that fruit. 
There is only one tree. So if I plant banana tree, I, I'm so sure you all know banana. I mean, you must have seen a banana tree before. It shouldn't take a revelation to know that. Understand that. So a banana tree is growing. I don't expect from that same banana tree to begin to get apple. To begin to get watermelon. Because the tree is, the tree tells you what the fruit is going to be. Have you ever seen a diverse tree before? That from that same tree, you get watermelon, granite, sugar, that, that kind of thing. It's only one thing you get from a tree. And that's the fruit that you get from a tree. But here we are talking about the spiritual truth here. And the spiritual truth is that the fruit of the spirit. So when we talk about the fruit of the spirit, people think we are talking about diverse fruits. There is only one fruit of the spirit. Only one. But there are manifestations of that fruit. Which means... On this same fruit of the Spirit. So some people will say, I've not grown in love. I've grown in goodness. No, you have not walked well in the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul said, then you will walk in the Spirit. And then you will also live in the Spirit. Because the manifestation of the fruits, not fruits. The manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit is that it will give you goodness. It will give you love. It will give you patience. It will give you kindness. It will give you self-control. The same spirit on the inside of the believer for different manifestation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that love is in you. Are you born again? Love is in you. Goodness is in you. Kindness is in you. Self-control is in you. Why are you therefore not working in it? That's what I'm talking about. Letting love dominate you. I'm not asking that you will have love. I'm talking about letting love do what? Jesus made that clear again. Because John 15, 15, he said, I am divine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much what? Look at that. Did he say fruits? He said fruits. The same fruit of the spirit. He that abides. So your abiding in him will determine your level of demonstration of the fruit of the spirit. So if I cannot see fruit on, in your life, if you tell me, you know what, anger is my problem. Or you say, I, I, I'm not just patient. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very patient person. Or you see, <laughs> the problem that guy has is that when he see cuffs and shape, he, he just falls. Now, that's not self-control there. That's a goat walking. Because you see, when a goat sees anything he likes, a goat pursues after him. No self-control. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is in this fruit of the spirit. That's how you know the difference. The manifestation and the demonstration even of the fruit of the spirit. So I'm trying to say that you cannot use carnal knowledge to understand the things of the spirit. Because carnal knowledge tells us that it is impossible to have a fruit and have different fruit on it. A tree and different fruit. But all that God gave you is to give you of himself. And if you let himself live inside of you, you will begin to see other manifestations of himself even in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? So do you get that I'm saying that there is the love inside of you? There's love, love inside of you. Can I give you another scripture to demonstrate that? Romans chapter 5 verse 5. The Bible says that now the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Where was it shed? Is it in your head? Is it in your psyche? Is in your mind. Now understand that when scripture talks about the art, it's not talking about the mind. The art is talking about your spirit. Anytime you hear, you see the word art in scriptures, it's talking about your spirit. So the love of God is shed abroad in your spirit. How do I mean man? I hope you all still understand that man is triune in nature. That means man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. So where is God shedding this love? Not on your reasoning. Don't worry, it will still make sense. I'll still make this very practical. It still makes sense. But I need you to understand that the core of you is where the love of God is. It's in your spirit. So the love of God has nothing to do with how you feel. The love of God has nothing to do with uh, what you think. The love of God has everything to do with the spirit. So what is this love I'm talking about? I'm not talking about the kind of love that is natural, human, human, sensual, carnal, or earthly. We love, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that love is from God. Bible says, now let us love one another. For love is what? Love is of God. Love is not of man. Love is not when you grow above 18. You now start feeling sin skies. No, that's not what love is. Love is of God. Love is not until you don't see love when they put ring on it. No, that's not love. That's commitment. Do you understand what I'm saying? Love is of God. 
The Bible says love is of God. Love is therefore not a human idea. Love is a God idea. Are you born again? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The Bible says uh, you are a new creature. All things are past. All things are new. I hope you understand that that old crea new creature talks about your spirit being alive to God. Your spirit is awakened to God. You are a born again believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and then verse 17. He who is joined with the Lord has become same spirit with him. Same spirit with him. You are same spirit with God. Therefore, whatever God can do, you can do because his spirit is in you. Is in you. The Holy Spirit on the inside of a believer is God on the inside of the believer. The moment you are born again, you receive what I call the DNA of love. A, a divine characteristics that makes you different from others. The DNA of love. So that when they check you out and check your DNA, they should find love there. Love is not an afterthought for the believer. Love is what a believer has been intrinsically wired with. You have the potential and the possibility to walk in love. Love. Love is of God. But we must let that love dominate us. We must let that love dominate us. We must let that love dominate us. I want to quickly run some things down you. You know, when I was growing up, I, I said this midweek service, but let me just run it down you so that it gives perspective and practicality to what I'm saying. All right, when I was growing up, one of the first things you understand uh, when you started your Christian journey, the first revelation is to understand that there are three kinds of love. I remember when we caught that revelation, we used to rejoice. Ha! <laughs> Eros, Eros, Philia, Agape. And then you, you feel like you have, you are on to something big. But listen to this. Many times we get it wrong when we define things the way they are not supposed to be defined. Can I, am I speaking with somebody? So that many of the people in the church have even misdefined and misrepresented what those words mean in the original Greek. You know, three words that means love in the original Greek language. Of course, there are other words like stooge. We talk about the love of a father to a child. But the three basic words that are used by the Greek and the also understood from scriptures is that word eros, which is E-R-O-S. And the word philia, uh, which is by the way one of the names of my daughter. And another word, which is the word agape. Now, when we talk about eros, people think that eros has to do only with sex, right? They say eros is sensual. Heros is sex. Heros is sensual. Heros is about uh, love. It's about sex. But that's wrong. That's not eros. I know it's that one where you get the word erotic from. Oh, so you watch erotic movies. You, you, they... But eros is more than that. Eros is actually what is called feeling love. That's what that word eros means. It means feeling love. So that you can actually love food. That kind of love is not agape. I know people, when you give them a box, I know a guy, when you give him a box of pizza, he says, like, ah, a box of pizza is the feeling that he gets from taking that food. Feeling love. Do you know what I'm saying? Some guys are in love with Asna. Even those of them that they love, they thought had died, when Asna started winning again, the love resurrected. So that when the match is going on, even if their father is calling them, they cannot hear. You know why? Because there is an eros. That's the feeling. It's a feeling love. It's the excitement and the adrenaline they feel when the match is going on. So it's, it's called feeling love. It's eros. So eros is good. In as much as it is binded by kingdom principles and the ways of God. You know some people love good perfume. It's, it's when they wear the perfume, how they feel. In fact, some ladies, that's one of their love language. When somebody smell good, oh, glory to God. Glory to God. That, 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 that hits them differently. Some people cannot deal with mouth odor. It also hits them differently. Glory to God. So, they, 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 that, that, that's the word eros. Do you know what I'm saying? All right? Stay with me. There's another word called the word philia. Philia love is the love that binds together. It's what you call brotherly love. But that's not even, that's not what it is. It, it's actually a love that is joined together by the same objective. Joined together by the same goal. So that if you keep, you know, people have companies and they start businesses and everybody's doing it together. They don't love each other. It's a common goal. There is a goal that joins them together. Many of these obedient people all over Nigeria, if they break it down, they don't agree on many principles. But there is a main goal and that's the man will be. So there are a lot of things that joins people together and makes them go at once. That is what you call philia. It's that love. 
is that love that binds. And why is this important? Because there are families that you call yourself brothers and sisters, but you know, like you know your name, that there's no love there. In fact, you can't trust them. Though they say they are blood. So that filia is not about blood joining you together. It's a place where you find common affinity. So there are offices where love binds together. That's the word filia. And you, so that when we talk about eros, eros is self-dependent. Eros is about self. I feel good. I feel good when I have sex. I feel good when I masturbate. I feel good. I feel good. It's about self. Filia is about we. So I'm still part of it. I'm still gaining something. Do you understand that? Now, agape is about others and God. Ask nothing, zero to do about it. Let me say this to you. When you see marriages fail, it is because they stop working in agape. I can assure you, even two people who don't know each other, they didn't hear any God voice, they didn't hear anything from God, and they got married, if both of them will live uh, by the agape love, their marriage will work. I'm, t- I'm telling you principles that will preserve your marriage, preserve your life, preserve your home, even after now. Shapes will fail. The way you feel now, you may not feel like that two years from now. Are you following what I'm saying? Oh, sweet art, sweetness. Oh, my honey pie, honey love. You call them names, but that name may be dependent on how they make you feel. In fact, that's how they come names. Says my sugar pie. Because when they see her, it fills them with sugar. When the, they don't feel like that anymore, we did not change it to my watermelon. Watermelon is still good. Then you can be hearing my bitter leaf. You see, uh, you know what I'm saying? So there, there, there are names that comes from how you feel. You know, when you say bitter leaf, it's it, it, it bitter, but it sweets me later. Glory to God. So there's this sweetness. You know, there are marriages that are like bitter leaf. It sweetens them, but it still makes them sad. Oh, glory to God. May your marriage not be bitter leaf. I, I, I can't live without her, but she caused me pain. It's that kind of, kind of rubbish. And, and that's because we stop living in agape. If you will live in agape, you can work with anybody. The craziest of them. I've met all kinds of men in my journey through life. All manners of men. Reptiles in human skin. Dogs in human skin. Snail, you know, let us do something. They can't do it. There are snails in human skin. There are all manners you will meet in your journey in life. Only agape will ensure that your love remains the same. Let me say this to you. Until you understand the love of God, I want to personally advise you. Don't marry. If you, until you can walk with God, walk with God and let the love spirit dominate you. That's what I'm talking about. Love domination. Don't get married. Because you see, all this, especially when she wears what she wears. I cannot even see anywhere. I, I, I don't, I don't understand. Hey, baby, Sean Murray. <laughs> you see, all those things, one child. Somebody say one child. Somebody was telling me, I cannot marry somebody who is big. I, I told him, I said, have you, did you, have you seen your mother's picture? Have you seen your mother's picture? She was slim like that. It's the work of your father that made him what he is. And you too, your work. Because when a woman expands, because the baby expands on the inside. So that your slim number one can now become your slim cough number two. You know what number two means? Be like this. She used to be like this. Now she's like this. So that you're asking yourself, he won't even say Tommy Trainer. What happens to the hips? Kill off, kill off, she by. Because the, everything is confusing to you. That's why many marriages fail. Because that guy is going to the gym 247 biceps. When he begins to pay school fees, he won't have time for biceps anymore. The reason he's keeping that bicep is not is because he's not eating well. Apple is the only thing he's eating. When a woman starts pounding, starts giving pandoya, he feels everything has happened to him. So 
the stomach start coming. You say, I'm a man of God, watch this. And then, <laughs> you don't worry to go. We now we deal with it. Well, we are ready to deal with it. I told one doctor, I said, ah, this is your stomach. I said, ah, I know what to do when I'm ready. I saw him five years. I said, Alpha. He said, Ejeka Baba. Let's just leave it this way. You know, it has become what it has become. If you marry six sisters, except the wrestler, he doesn't have any reason to keep it for life. He doesn't. He doesn't. So that you, you will not, you will not go on Instagram. You will be seeing some very young, young with biceps guys. And then you, you, you adjust your phone. You start watering in your mouth and say, ma, 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 lado, have You can't tell anybody, but you are already getting wet just looking at pictures. God have it. Say, my, my husband used to be like this. You are hungry in a way that is no longer like that. But it's what it is. Now he has become a very stout guy. You know what they call stout? God is law. Now I wonder. You see, Paul was somebody who was able to walk in this kind of law. And he, he gave us a description and a depiction of what this love is. So that's how I'm going to run. Now. We're going to read First Corinthians 13 and we're going to look at what love is. And I'm going to bring out 10 principles of love from that place. And after that, some of you are going to go home and start apologizing to everybody. Because your problem is not the devil. Your problem is yourself. Amen. First Corinthians 13, and then we read verses 4 to 8. Are you with me? Are you with me? I, I, think, I, think, I think it's there. Is it there? Yeah, the amplifier. Yeah, it's there. So you can follow me. That's the amplified version. The Bible says, love endures. Follow me. How many of us want to get married? Raise your hand. Want to get married? How many of you want to work with people? Some of you don't want to get married because of what you have seen, experience. It's, it's crazy. You see, I, 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 I can relate. But that is not what love is. What you experience is not what love is. Listen to me in this church today. And I'll tell you what love is. Because you will see that. In fact, in your very eyes, I will show you who, who was in error. You will see that it was your dad and your mom. You see what this is why you have been blaming your mom. You will discover it's your dad. Follow me. And I don't want to fix problem. I want to fix your life. That's what the word God, of God does. He fixes life. Look at that. Let's, let's go. Let's go. The Bible says love endures with patience and serenity. Love endures with what? Love is kind and thoughtful. Love is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag. And is not proud or arrogant. You see that idea? It's my idea. I gave it, I gave it to you. <laughs> see brag. You see that? Love does not brag. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoke, nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with truth. When right and truth prevail, love bears all things, regardless of what comes. Believes all things, looking for the best in each one. Hopes all things, remaining steadfast, even during difficult times. Ah, Surulereo, Surulereo. You know these things we say, I can't suffer with anybody. Don't worry. Don't worry. I remember I stayed before my ogre. He said, my children. I said, you know, your children are just blessed. Uh, you are very rich. You are very comfortable. You can afford to send them anywhere. He looked at me. I said, Josiah, life will teach them. They may not lack money, but life will teach them. Life has a curriculum for everybody. A curriculum for everybody. So that the sons of the rich will be schooled in the school of delay. Some of them will be schooled in the school of stagnation. Some of them will be schooled in the school of uh, no love, disappointment, heartbreak. They will be eating breakfast solidly morning, noon, and night. <laughs> love never fails. No, no, no. I have jumped it. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the gift of special knowledge, it will pass away. I want to share with you the characteristics of a love-dominated life. And I'm going to pick them from this scripture. You understand that? The characteristics of a love-dominated life. Some of you are already breathing down heavily. And that's the way, that's, you see, the word of God comes to reprove, to correct, to instruct in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good works. That's what scripture says. All right, number one, 
Love endures with patience and serenity. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. The Bible says, love endures with patience and serenity. He endures without complaining, without ever losing his joy, without losing hope. I know that things are not the way they used to be for him. Things are not the way they used to be for your father. But your mom is waiting and very patient. She's a good woman. But she's complaining. So when love waits, love does not complain. Ah, when will God do it for me? When will God do it for me? And then you now start complaining. Look at George. He has has moved forward. Look at this one. You see now, what is going on here? Is that love has started complaining. Love endures. Waits patiently without complaining. Remember Christ endured on the cross. And he never complained. Not for one did he cost. Not for once did he cost the people. That put him on the cross. Like a sheep before the shearer he kept silent. You know sometimes people actually endure a lot. But they never receive. And it's not working in love. Because even as they are enduring they are complaining. Have you met crony complainers before? Ah, this job is hard. Though. This job is hard. They have not paid us. <laughs> and they, they are still on the wall. But they complain morning, noon, and night. Listen, when you are patient, patience have its perfect work when patience is quiet and in rest. That's the word serenity. You are in rest. If you are going to walk in love and you are saying, okay, this man is uh is a, is a man that God is still working on. This woman is a woman God is working on. Then your patience must have a perfect work. That means that it must be in rest. You cannot be complaining. You can't love somebody and and keep complaining every day about her shape. Why are you this big? I love him. Why are you this big? Oh, love her. Because if you really love her, you will love the whole package. Am I saying she, she can't be better? It can't be better? Yes, it can. But as he continues on that journey, you can't complain. At the other times, my wife has come to me. You know, she will have her own tongue. She can use me as her own example. I don't care. She will have her own tongue. But listen to this. And she will tell me, I think I'm big. I have never said, because to bust so. If you just use the mistake to say, I think you're big. Oh, she's the one that asked to. <laughs> that traps that are that only the wisdom of Jesus can help you win. Traps. They will ask you, I think I'm gaining weight. They are asking you, and they want truthful husband. So just say, I think so. You are in trouble. You say, you say, sometimes I don't even respond. Can't you hear me? I have a very common answer. I even don't know what to say. It's very. Is that? I don't even know what to say. Have ne- eh? What? And when they ask you that question, for guys that are not very wise, they are asking you, am I still beautiful? So the answer is not, oh, you are not big, you are big. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. Because if you don't understand the question, you can't get the answer. Many things are jam questions. They are not direct. So when a lady or a woman is asking you questions, don't be fast to answer. You will put yourself in trouble. Love endures with patience and serenity. Number two, love is not jealous or envious. First Corinthians 13 verse 4. Love is not jealous or envious. Christians should never be jealous or envious of other people. Someone bought a car. Praise God. Hallelujah. They know me. You buy a car. I'm entering the car. I'm starting it. I'm praying. I will sit down on the inside. Because God has blessed you in our community. It means God is in our community. My home is next. It may not be next next year, but it will be next one day. But I'm not going to judge my sources by your sources. Believers are supposed to celebrate and not compete with one another. That's what love is. Agape love is about celebrating other people's success. Love is never jealous or envious. That's why as a man, if your woman is making it in life, you should celebrate. They're having a dinner for her. Follow her. Was suit, but don't dress more than her. So that they know that she's the one. 
You are so comfortable in your space. Not that, ah, hey, God, and you are not putting pressure on yourself. You will die before your own time. Don't do that. Love is not envious. Love is not jealous. Some of you, you are, you are, you are already dating somebody. She greeted somebody at the mall. You used two hours to ask, who is that person? Where do you know her from? You are not, there's no love there. That's feeling. Agape believes all things. Agape believes all things. It doesn't make you a dumb person, but it believes all things. God believes the best from us. This is the love of God. Where do you know her from? You want to check phones. I've never read my wife's chat. Never did. What am I looking for? You see, many of these things vastly depend on who you marry. You have entered a journey with a person that is going nowhere. You are going to live all your life doubting him or her. That's why, listen to this, agape is not eros. Agape is not failure. Agape can only be demonstrated by the born again, a born again child of God. Only a believer can walk in agape. And that's why I tell people that the best of all, the worst of us is better than the best of the world. The worst of us is better than the best in the world. Why? Because they don't have the seed of the spirit. They don't have the fruit of the spirit. They can never walk in love. You can walk in agape. He's not envious. He's not jealous. Ah, my husband is jealous. So. <laughs> my husband is jealous. Don't marry him. I'm telling you. Before he goes and kills somebody on your behalf, because if you love the person and the love of God, love trusts. Absolutely. Love trusts fully. Therefore, you see, my dad was preaching one day and he said, I've never forgotten it. He said, trust is the foundation of love. If you don't trust the person, there's no way you can love them. No way. Therefore, if trust is questioned, don't get married. It's not by force. Jealous people everywhere. That tells you there's no agape. Many marriages have been ruined by jealousy. In fact, jealousy is such an age-old problem that even in scriptures, if a man is just suspecting that his wife has slept with somebody, there is something called the ways, the seed and of jealousy. There, there is a, God told them to take of ashes and then mix it with some leaves and some fragrance and give the woman to drink. To swear that she was faithful. This is not because she was caught in the act. This is simply because a man suspected. And if by any means she had actually broken the covenant of marriage, scripture says she would swell in her stomach and her stomach would be rotten. Found in scriptures, where is that for a man? Because that's why there are many rascals out there. Very great rascals. We need to say something true to ourselves. Number three, love is not self-seeking. First Corinthians chapter 13 and then verse 5. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking. Love puts others first. You see, some people are not good Christians because it's, their life is always about themselves. It's always about them. That's why, you see, I, I tell people that our world has become such a selfish generation. That it is even the reason why now the camera is facing you. You know these days the best cameras face you. On your phone. You have 13 MB. Face MB. MPPS. How do you pull it? Megapixel. Facing you. And eight facing others. Why? Because they just know that you are a generation that is interested in self. So you don't do anything that you don't profit. What will I gain? What will I benefit? Is your major. That's why there are no volunteers anymore. People don't want to ask, what would the other person gain? You see, in marriage, in love, you must learn to put the other person first. Putting yourself for, you see, I, I hear people say, it's feminists who say, I, I don't do that for anyone. I can't do that for anybody. It's about me. It's about my life. Oh, grandma, boredom is waiting for you and loneliness at 45. You know, there are things that the world teaches that there's no wisdom. It's just loudness. We have a very loud generation, but little wisdom. The wisdom is still in scriptures. It's not in the word. It's in scriptures. Love knows that all he has is of the law. Therefore, love does not brag. Love is not proud. Love doesn't boast. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. They bought, you bought a phone for somebody last year. You are still talking about it now. 
If I don't love you, would I have bought phone for you? You're asking me, do I love you? If I don't love you, would I have bought phone for you? He didn't ask that. Oh, must you bring that phone conversation into now? Brag. Bragging. You just want to gain bragging rights. You, you, you see, some people are dating ladies because they want to gain bragging rights. Not because, it's not because they love the person. They just feel that this person will complete me. She's light in complexion. She's, she's, she's an hourglass. She dresses well, smells good, speak good English. I by my side, we just become a power couple. A power couple. Hallelujah. And therefore, people are exploding like mechano generators. Breaking down every time. What's going on? Yes. <laughs> What's going on? Because they don't have a foundation that is selfless. I got, see, I got a, a job. I bought, the clothes is when I bought it. That's why when you see some arrogant people, when they're breaking up, breaking up with them, they say, oh, yeah, remove everything, remove everything, drop everything. And people are smiling and laughing. It tells you that we are so far from agape. If you have done it as unto God, and because love was the driving force, you would have let it go. Because if you can buy it and give it away, it means that you are sorry to afford it. You might call it sacrifice, but love does not brag. Love is not rude. How can, as I saw someone say, remove your wig in public, remove your wig. Ah, oh, the fire, remove the nonsense, the sin underneath. Oh my God. The hair has not been treated for a while. And, and he removed the sin. What do you call rudeness more than that? Love is not rude. That is rudeness. Number four, love is not provoked. We may have a provocation level. You know, we all have provocation level. Even God had. It was provoked when Israel sinned and told Moses, let me destroy them. All. Let me destroy them. Because they continually live in unbelief. Therefore, we are not saying love is not provoked. But we say love is not easily provoked. Love is not overly, you see, for you to understand it, read the margin of the amplified version, 13.5. Scripture says that love is not overly sensitive and easily angered. Do you know people who are just touch and go? Even when you are working with them, you are very conscious. The things you say. Because you know that they will spark. They are like electric circuit that is out of place. Do you know? That's somebody, that's not love. They those people, they don't, they are, that, that's not love. Somebody was telling me about how a lover, a server and a lover were going in a car and somebody bashed their car. You know, you don't eat my car. They were supposed to speak English. Is that not so? I saw they were speaking English, you know, in Lagos, love English goes on and they're raising their voice. And they were speaking English. And the guy looked at the lady and said, no, 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 no. I, I'm not at fault. No, the lady said, you are at fault. Ah, it's my girl you are talking to like that. The man crossed the bonnet and started punching. The spirit of the father entered him. You know, and punched the guy. The blood was coming and he was still punching the guy. The lady said, when they entered the car park, she was even afraid. Eh? What kind of animal is this? That was the end of that relationship. But you know, he's my protector. <laughs> that protector will soon protect something against you too. Because you can see that the provocation level and the, the response to provocation is not love. Number five, love does not take into account a wrong endured. Love does not take into account a wrong endured. First Corinthians, Corinthians 13 and then verse 5. It means love has no place for retribution. Some of you are planning retribution against your father. Now, you are still planning it. Because the man messed up. So, <laughs> you are waiting to blow. The reason your blowing is being elongated is because of this. Oh. That's the, God cannot blow you and make you blow so that you can treat your father's mess up. That's what some people want to do. We are in a generation that 
People will say, my, my dad, you are fully. I mean, people say things about their father. I don't care how crazy the man is. The kind of language you use, I, I should be measured. He might, you might call him, he, he, he might have done something stupid. He might have left you and abandoned you. But that doesn't say, that man, he's a madman. He's a madman. The seed you carry. I mean, you're walking, you are the seed. It shows me that the love of God has not entered into. And somebody said, you, you don't know what he has done. I've got stories to tell. And I'll tell you. There was a woman, there's a lady. I know her, not story. She told me herself. From the age of nine, her father was sleeping with her. First one was raping. And then continually. He will come at night. He got to a point. The lady will just keep quiet. The girl, a nine-year-old, did it consistently for two years. When the lady was 11, she went to her mother and said, Mom, this one. If man said, Ah, I've seen you the way you behave. You want to spoil my home. You are a witch. You have told me before. A prophet had told me before. A witch. So she kept quiet. This man did it to the age of 14. No, she should have reported to the police. I thought so too. But the man is a police officer. Today, when I spoke to her, she was telling me and she was crying. And you know, I've seen people cry. And I've seen cry. You know, they are crying. Mm -hmm. I've seen agony, agony. People are crying and they are raging. You will feel like their heart is, it's like they want to, they want to cut out of themselves. And she was crying. And inside of my mind, I felt let us go and buy a gun. Go and go and die faster. But I told her, you will forgive. As I was saying it, something in my head was saying, Messiah, you are nowhere. I'm this is real. You see, the battles of life are real. The, the, the things, spiritual things are real. My man was saying, Messiah, you are nowhere. Kojina now, we can, ah, even let's gather boys. Let's just meet him on the road and let him just feel something. They can even destroy that private part. And let him be going. Let him become castrated. There were things coming from my head. But I said, you have, to lo you have to forgive. God said, we must let go of offense. I said, do you pray the Lord's Prayer? I said, yes. So what does he say? Help me with the Lord's Prayer. Gain your voice. Oh. Don't lose your voice now. Gain your voice. Oh, oh yeah, go. We'll be done on that. Our daily bread. May he give you good bread. Verse this passage. May he do what? May he do what? Do you understand simple English? As you. So to the level of your forgiveness is the level of the forgiveness you receive. But that man was bad, but you are a terrible person. I'm telling you. Do you know how many people you have slept with? Do you know how many things you have done that is wrong? Jesus looked at you and taught you a word for you. And for the self-righteous folks among us, even the best of righteousness could not have kept you from hell. You needed a savior. And sin let Jesus die. The reason you forgive and let go is not because of others. It's because of you. Unforgiveness is like taking poison and expecting someone else to die. Sit down very comfortably. When I get here, I know, I know, it's normal. Love does not put it to account. A lady, a married woman, messed up. In a moment of craziness, she went and slept with somebody. Are you following me? She went and did what? Slept with somebody in a moment of madness. She went by herself and confessed to her husband. Some of you think that's stupid, Abby. It's stupid, it's stupid. Not supposed to do that. But that just tells me you don't have the spirit of Christ if you have said that. So, the man, after four months of processing, it's not easy. 
of processing. He said, I've forgiven you. And so they are fine. But every, every day that he wakes up on the other side of the bed, he reminds her of how she's a slut. And now I cannot trust you. And now I had a vision or a dream that you're about to go and sleep with somebody. God told me, God told me to tell you, you're just about to go and sleep with somebody again now. Please tell me, is that the love of God? He does not forget. You see, forgiving the, the wrong done to you, you must let it go. Some of you just want error. You, you still remember the clothes that person wore. The clothes he wore and what he said to you. Yeah? You should not have come to church before you came. <laughs> you remember what he said. That's not the agape love. Number six, love doesn't rejoice at injustice. First Corinthians 13 and verse 6, he doesn't rejoice at injustice. Love does not rejoice at the failings or the, or the mishap of a perceived enemy. Do you know there are people you don't like? When you now hear that that girl that they told you no <laughs> has become pregnant outside of marriage. <laughs> You say, we said it. We said it. Go summon Gidilara on the hour. You see, you see. Why are you rejoicing? Your passive enemy. There is a lady in your street you have been trying to greet. She doesn't answer you. But recently you just heard that they have sagged her. That is why it's not good to be proud. You see? You see. What, what is it now? You see now? It's back to the level. You see? You are rejoicing at the, at, at the odds of your perceived enemy. Some of you came from homes where there are four husbands, sometimes four wives. Oh, have you, don't you know there are four husbands? Ah, you people don't work. I've seen places where the father of the, of the first child, the father of the second child, the father of the third child, there are four husbands in the house. I've been, I've, I've seen people like that. And so, because you came from that kind of a house, when somebody prospers, but the daughter or the son of another wife prospers, you are not happy. For you, it's a competition. That's not law. Look at him and say, that's not law. So that the guy that cheated you, you don't want him to prosper. Only me lay, my head is hard. That's it. You see, all these things we say, my head is hard. You, oh, you see, <laughs> my God is not far. <laughs> my God is not far. <laughs> Rejoicing at the destruction of a perceived enemy. That's not love of God. What, what's love of God? Love bears all things. Regardless of what comes. Love bears, that's number seven, it bears all things. Patiently waiting. Not grudgingly complaining about the journey. Patiently waiting. Bears all things. Paul said, I've learned to rejoice, to be, to, when I'm, when, when I have plenty, when I have lack, I have learned to be contented. In whatever state I am, bears all things. Love bears all things. It's the love of God that makes some people be us in this church also. Sometimes you come, the sun is not okay. Love be us all things. Love be us all things. Love. Love be us all things. Somebody is speaking English. You are trying to encourage the person. The English is so terrible that you are afraid. Love be us all things. Be us all things. He said, good morning. He oozes out. Good morning. Good morning. He loses out to you. Love be as all things. I've seen people who, you, they can't call themselves Christians. The way they behave. Love be as all things. It suffers long. Number eight. Love believes all things. Anytime you are always doubting, it shows me that you are not, work of love has not been perfected in your life. Love believes all things. Looking for the best in others. Trusting others. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Knowing that everyone can become great. 
You see, if you are walking in love of God, you will never lose hope and faith in men. No matter how bad they have gone, no matter how terrible their situation is, you know that love can turn it around. God can turn it around. Love believes all things. Be as all things. I tell people, if you come to me and say that you have just built a house in Ekoi, I believe you. You may look like you are not even like that. I believe you. Because love believes all things. I'll tell you somebody. I said, good girls are in church. He said, where do you find them, sir? He said, they are everywhere. Are you blind? They are everywhere. He said, all these girls are everywhere. I said, I can count 20 virgins in the church. He said, how do you know, sir? I said, they told me and I believe all things. I believe. I believe all things. But you, you doubt all things. You doubt all. In fact, you know that some people's normal place of operation, modulus operandi, is to doubt. They tell them they are going to promote them, they doubt it. If somebody says, I'm coming to you for you to, they doubt it. Even in that relationship they are presently, they are doubting the character, the nature of the person. They, they are normal factory setting. Default setting is to doubt. Love believes all things. Number nine, love is standing firm in hope. Love remains steadfast and immovable in difficult times. Love. It remains steadfast, immovable, even in difficult times. Stop running around from one guy to another. It will change. Things change. Only God is unchanging. If God has said to you, that is your man, you believe it with the whole of your heart, come and get ready to stay. One thing love has is that you are staying in power. It's resolutely committed. Stay in power. Oh, I've stayed. You know, I tell people that life will test you. Doctors are here. They will tell you that people who do IVF, IVF even fails. They do everything to have a child. It fails. So that life is teaching them patience. You can now say, ah, it's the woman, no? And go around and go and be donating your sperm. Just understand that the end of it is all. Patience. Stay in power. Commitment. What if the man does not get contract? He's a, he's a contract guy. What if he doesn't get a contract in a year? Won't your relationship break? And finally, love never fails. I've had guys say, I used to love that girl, oh. <laughs> I used to love that guy. Girl, I don't love her anymore. That's why I tell you that love is commitment. Love is not what you feel. Feeling? Feeling is too ephemeral to base your life upon. If I hit when I feel hungry, I would have died. If I pray when I feel I pray, I will not pray. If I read the Bible because I feel like reading the Bible, I won't read the Bible. Because I really feel like doing those things. I'm telling you, really feel is discipline that makes you do it. Life is not feeling. It's not the way it makes me feel. It's a commitment to be steadfast and to stay with this guy. That commitment, that's what love is about. That's what love is about. And you know what? Love never fails. If you marry somebody and you're working in Agape, love never fails. Go and write this down. Me and this woman will not divorce herself. Write it down. It can never happen. If she says she's not doing it again, I'll tell her, there is nothing you can do. Ah. She knows me. You know what they call Ababa Kun Yoruba? He who dies when the king dies. This one is not going anywhere. And she knows this one is not going anywhere. If we have lived our life based on feelings, 
would have caught paper for each other. Because me, I see anything. She, she cannot understand why you will speak that. And me, I will say, don't judge me by my words. Judge me by my heart. She will say, your words are hard. And your words are from your heart. And I will say, even if I hurt you, you should know that it was not intentional. Look at the intent. I will never intend to love you, to hate you, to, to, to hurt you. Then we'll go on and on and on. And eventually, we'll come to that circle again where love meets. Because love never fails. If your marriage fails, it's because you people worked in errors. Errors fail you. So when scripture says love never fails, he's not talking about errors. He's not talking about what it makes you feel. You know, I told us that errors is about feeling love. It's not even about sex. It's about feeling love. It's the feeling you get by holding her close. <laughs> My heart's tired, papi. Eight. When I'm close to you, I tell you I can compose any kind of song when it comes. If it's you, I'll be looking at Mumama Solo. They are just continue. Why? Because love is from the heart. But that is the love that benefits me and self. But when it's about her, when it's about her, how does she look? How will she come to church? How will this happen? I'll tell you a story and that will be the end of it. I remember one time that I was using a vehicle. A vehicle. You know, there's a difference between a car, a vehicle, and a machine. Do you understand that? I was using a vehicle. Uh, so that I parked the vehicle. You can even park the vehicle outside. There's nothing that will happen to the vehicle. Do you understand? So I was using a vehicle. And uh, many, some people here know the vehicle. And hmm, I was using a vehicle. So that um, it was it was a gallant 1989 series. Uh, if you go, if you press it on Google now and just press Miss Bushi Gala 1989, my home will come out on your right corner down to your left. You see it there. But that's when they manufactured it. I, I got it after Nigeria had used it for like 18 years. So that the car, sometimes I'm going and the car will be honey by itself. And I'll be wondering, my hand is here and the car is on it. Go, 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 go. And sometimes when you just park and restart the thing, it will pick up by itself. So the guy has a growth of just resetting it. So eventually, uh, I remember one time that a driver took the car. He was a driver in our workplace. And I gave him the car to go somewhere. And he came back and said, how do I drive the car? A driver cannot even drive it. So he took diligence. That's why I started calling the car diligence. He took diligence to drive the car. So one time, they will now give us, the Lord blessed us with the camp. Been hacked so that I, I and I've seen this happen in homes. I mean, I remember a couple came to Reverend George after the Lord had bought them, had given them a Mazda 323, and they were fighting on who will be driving the Mazda 323. Needless to say, they drove that car, they drove that car till that car failed. God was afraid to bless them with more because the former blessing caused the fight. Are you following what I'm saying? So they asked me, which car will your wife drive? For me, it was a no-brainer. Let me continue with the gallant and let her drive the car. So she took it to work one day. And her boss called her a very good believer. Ah! Why will you bring this car? Why will pastor be driving? They were not supposed to be pastor like that in a gallant. I said, tell her, it's our car. Please, be carrying that car. Because love puts others even first. If that car breaks down, the entire world, which it will break down, I, I can, I'm so sure it will be my trouble to still come. I will not get there. People will be trying to help her. We'll get there in a Camry. They say, ah, awkwardly. How does that look? Does that not look like you are stupid or mad? That, how did you marry this one? Some of you, I mean, she you or she most times uses the best things in it. That is what love is supposed to be. 
putting others first. But we are a selfish generation. And that's how far we have walked away from that. It's always about us. It's always about us. So you can't buy your guy and a 150k who blots. Who blots? Please watch! Or you can do a 300k week for yourself. If I also look at it, week, week, week. Because that's what you think. It's the way of love to put others forth. God did not need to die for himself. God didn't have to die to save himself. He died for us. If you walk in agape, your life will be better. It's not going to be about what you can get. And that's how marriage will work. That's how our homes will work. That's how relationship work. That's how you are the better person at the place of work. You are not a believer if you are the worst person to work with. Saucy, saucy girl. Huh? Well, excuse me, man. That's not the representative of Christ. The love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. It's there. So we don't need a laying of hands. It's there. It's time to let it dominate you. To live even by the love of God. Bow down your head, bow down your heart. And I want you to look at concretely the things I've said to you. I look at the pain that some people have caused you. Look at the pain. Look at the things they have said about you. Look at how terrible some people have been to you. Do me a favor. Can you let it go? Not for their sake, for the sake of Jesus. Can you let it go? Can you give it all to Jesus? Can you surrender it all to him? Can you surrender it all to him? Can you let it go? Somebody here needs to forgive. You need to call your father and, and start telling him, see, what you did is not okay. But I forgive you. You abandoned us. But I forgive you. You didn't care. But I let it go. There's a guy that somebody here, you have to forgive because he took away the flower. And then he just left like nothing happened. He used you. You need to let him go. Because your next level is dependent on him. You need to let him go. Choosing to walk in God's law is not for the benefit of others. It's for our benefit. You need to let him go. You need to say, God, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. If that lady who let her father walk her down the high when she was getting married. If that lady could let that happen, you can do the same. You can do the same. You can let it go. You can tell Jesus to take the wheel. People have hurt you. Life had happened to you. Being a Christian is not about retribution. Being a Christian is not about loving people because they deserve it. It's about loving them because of Jesus. It's about praying for people even when we hate them. When we think they have not, they are not, they haven't merited anything. There are people you see, you just lose your joy. You lose your happiness. There are people you hear about, you just lose your joy, you lose your happiness. It's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. I'm not asking you to do something that is easy by the flesh. But again, the love of Christ is spread abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. Probably started a business for somebody. I mean, all the money you made, you, you started a business with a guy and he's in love with you. It's gone. It's gone with you. And every time you see with another girl, you feel like just, but you've got to let it go. You can't change yourself to yesterday. There's liberty, there's freedom, there's riches, there's greatness in your tomorrow. Let it go. Let God heal your heart. From the heroes of the past. Somebody here, God just told me, you, you need to forgive yourself. It's not even others. You need to forgive yourself. You need to forgive yourself. 
you need to forgive yourself. It's 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 you. You felt that you are the reason why you are you are raped, you are taken advantage of. God said to tell you that wasn't you. It was the wickedness of man. Forgive yourself. People warned you, yes, they warned you. But you went, you continued. God said to tell you, it's still not your fault. It's still not your fault. It's time to let the love of Christ dominate you. It's time to release yourself to the future, to that tomorrow. We don't love people because they deserve it. We don't love people because they treat us right. That is filia. We don't love people because we have a common goal. We are believers. We love people from the place of our spirit, man. The love of Christ in our hearts. Shed abroad in our hearts. Shed abroad in our hearts. Shed abroad in our hearts. Heart. Can you say, Lord, I'm letting this go. You've been chained to your yesterday. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. So somebody needs to love you. You need to love yourself for who you are. Love yourself for your errors, for your mistake, for you and your body, your back, everything. That's you. You've got to love yourself. This is just this is just a healing moment. I want you to take this very seriously. I want to take this very seriously. And just and just hold on to God and say, God, today I put it at the feet. I put it at your feet. The many disappointment. The many trusting of men and then failing you. I put it at your feet. This is the love of Christ. This is not the love of men. This is not because your father was well, your mother did good. That's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. This is about God loving us enough to die on the cross for our sins and putting a measure of himself, the fruit of love on our inside. You need to just let it go. After now, somebody's going to listen to this sermon and that person has gone through a lot of things like the whole world is against you. But you need to let it go. Let go. Let go of it all. Because there is a fullness of blessings in your tomorrow. There is fullness of blessing. There is fullness of blessing in your tomorrow. It's time to walk in God's plan, God's mandate, and God's revelation for your life. And you can't allow your presentness to stop you. You can't be chained to your yesterday. You can't be chained to the memory of the past. You've got to let it go. Oh, guys are just dogs. The ladies are just dogs. That's what you say. And because of that, you, you've missed out on opportunities. You've got to let it go. And know your present spouse is not a perfect person. The person you are dating is not perfect. If I did, it's terrible. It's a terrible being. Uh, but listen, folks. Your family, your father may have been a terrible person. But if you return terrible for terrible, you reduce yourself to their level. God is calling you to come up either. Because when they go down, we should go higher. We should live from our spirit, man. When you start saying that, that ought will lose its hold over you. That ought loses its hold over you. It won't be able to chain you down anymore. Somebody, when you were very young, very young, you felt very abandoned. They abandoned you literally. Abandoned you literally. And you've not been able to let go of that memory. And sometimes you leave her. With that in mind, like when, I, when, when things happen for me, I'm going to go back and show them. Jesus said there's nothing to show but his love. There's nothing to demonstrate but his love. There's nothing to tell the world but his grace. There's nothing to show but his mercy. There's no room for retribution at the cross. There's no room for retribution at the cross. Can I say to somebody again, there's no room for retribution at the cross. There's no room for avenging yourself at the cross. There's no room for vengeance at the cross. There's only love at the cross. Love at the cross. Will you pour it all on Jesus and watch what he will do with your life? If you feel like crying, just see, just ensure you leave this place in. Ensure you leave this place totally redeemed, restored, and broken. Even from that past, there's a beautiful tomorrow. You made a mistake and you lost some money. And you, you've held on to that. Held on to that. Right now, you can't even trust anybody anymore. And that's why you find it difficult to even enter into new alliances God is bringing your way. God said to tell you it's time to let it go. God said to tell you it's time to let it go. It's time to walk in the fullness of his blessings. It's time to walk in the fullness of his blessedness. For you and your family. For you and yours. 
It's time. It's time. It's time. There's no room at the cross for cry. There's no room at the cross for planning revenge. No room at the cross for planning retribution. No room at the cross. 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 No room at the cross for offense. Bible says offense will come. It's not may. It is, it is that it will come. But we must have the faith and the heart to let it go. To let it go. Is it, does it mean that person has changed? Does it mean that person will not alter you again? He will. He might. If he's your father, if he's your mother, you marry to the person, they might. But they must lose their hold to hurt you again. They must lose their power to hurt you again. There is a cloud of glory right now in this room. Let him carry your cross. Let him take it all. Let him take it all. Yes, you've lost your fly, you've lost your virginity. But Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I'm able to renew and restore you. Thank you for listening. This has been The Living Word. If you have been blessed by this teaching or for counseling or any other inquiry, kindly send us an email to pfa at the ransomedhouse.com or fisayoadenii at yahoo.com or please call 0912-772-3824. The Ransomed House, empowering people to live for Jesus.